Imagine this. You're a scholar living in a peaceful, closed-off Japan during the 16th century. The world, as you know it, is serene, orderly, and, well, predictable. Then one day, the sea spits out these strange beings. They have pale skin, large noses, and hair that practically glows under the sun. They wear bizarre clothing made of materials you've never seen. And when they speak, it sounds like the cawing of crows. Now, tell me, what would you think if you were in their sandals? Are they demons? Gods? Spirits? Or just really lost? Well, folks, this is exactly what happened in 1543 when the first Europeans, a bunch of Portuguese traders, washed up on the tiny island of Tanegashima. Japanese historians at the time were, understandably, a little perplexed. And by perplexed, I mean they were flipping through their scrolls, scratching their heads, and wondering if their sake was a bit too strong that day. One historian, in particular, Fujiwara Saika, a Confucian scholar, wrote, Get this. These men wear a second skin of some unknown material that glitters like the scales of a fish. They carry weapons that roar like thunder and spit fire. Truly, they must be sorcerers from a distant land. Imagine trying to wrap your head around that when your most exotic experience was probably reading ancient Chinese texts. But here's the kicker. They weren't just scared. They were fascinated. These Europeans, these Nanban, or southern barbarians, became the talk of the town, the subject of countless discussions, debates, and frankly, some very wild theories. Rumors spread like wildfire. Some said they were the descendants of a lost tribe from China. Others claimed they were from a mythical land west of India, a place spoken of only in ancient legends. But my favorite? There was this persistent belief that these Europeans were actually giant human-shaped birds. Yes, you heard that right, birds. How else could they cross such vast oceans? It didn't help that the Portuguese had these guns, Tanagashima as they became known, named after the very island they landed on. The Japanese had never seen anything like them. A weapon that could kill from a distance, without even drawing a sword? It was pure sorcery. Or, maybe just the coolest thing they'd ever seen. The introduction of these firearms caused such a stir that the daimyos, the feudal lords of Japan, started incorporating them into their armies almost immediately. You can imagine the scene. Samurai warriors, traditionally bound by their swords and strict codes of honor, now carrying these clunky, loud, and strangely addictive new weapons. It was like handing out rocket launchers at a fencing match. But there's more to this story, much more. You see, these Europeans brought something even more powerful than guns. They brought Christianity. Jesuit missionaries, like Francis Xavier, saw Japan as a land ripe for conversion. And for a while, it seemed like they might succeed. Thousands of Japanese converted, fascinated by this new religion that promised eternal life, an afterlife, and a whole new set of stories and rituals. But it wasn't all smooth sailing. As more and more Europeans arrived, suspicions grew. Historians began to question the true intentions of these foreigners. Were they merely traitors? Or were they the vanguard of an invading force sent to soften Japan for conquest? This fear wasn't entirely unfounded. After all, they'd seen what happened to their neighbors in the Philippines. The unease reached a boiling point in the early 1600s. The Tokugawa shogunate, having united Japan under their rule, decided they had seen enough. The Europeans, once strange curiosities, were now seen as a clear and present danger. Christianity was banned and the country was sealed off. Only a tiny Dutch trading post was allowed to remain, under strict supervision, in Nagasaki. Japan would remain isolated for over 200 years, until Commodore Perry's black ships forced open the doors in 1853. By then, the memory of those first strange Europeans had faded into legend, their presence remembered only in whispers and old, yellowing scrolls. So, the next time you think about first contact between cultures, remember the Japanese historians, those men and women who tried to make sense of the impossible, who looked at these strange new arrivals and saw, well, something between a bird, a sorcerer, and a demon.